As early as 440 BCE, people have been complaining about continents. When Herodotus, the so-called father of geography, wrote how confused he was that three names had been given to a tract which is in reality one, referring to how Europe, Asia, and Africa are all in fact connected by land. Making this probably the oldest question in geography, what is a continent? Recently, people have started to ask whether or not the term continent is even valid or necessary to have and have begun suggesting doing away with it all together. And, well, as a person who explains geography for a living, this is a bad idea. Don't get me wrong, I think it's fine if we throw away the term continent so long as we replace it with the unit of a continent. Let me explain. So the same way we have kilometers, which are the biggest, meters, which are human-sized, and then centimeters, which are the smallest, we should have geographical units, land masses, which should be the biggest, continents, which are on the human scale, and regions, which should be the smallest. Each one helping to describe an increasingly specific space. And in both of these cases, the middle one becomes what's most useful for humans to use. Like imagine instead of telling someone you were 1.8 meters tall, you had to say you were 0 0.0018 kilometers tall. Yeah, it's just not useful information. Now try describing which countries are in the EU without mentioning a continent. It's the countries that are on the northeast corner of the biggest landmass, but only those north of the Mediterranean Sea and east of Russia. It's a lot easier to just say they are the ones that are found in Europe. Because of this, the idea of just dropping the concept of continents, to me at least, seems kind of ridiculous and something that would really only cause more confusion. I think the real problem people have is, as it stands now, continents are vague. Like, the definition for landmass is very clear, any place that isn't ocean, and the definition of region is generally an area of land which is homogeneous in terms of land cover, a rainforest, a mountain, a desert. Simple. So, I think the solution to all this confusion isn't to do away with what's actually the most useful unit to have, but to come up with a better, more rigid definition for a continent. And the best way to do this so that we all understand, I think, is to build one from scratch. Before we do that though, I just want to warn you that some things in this are going to be arbitrary. All units are arbitrary, even things like the meter are, which were originally defined as one ten millionth of the distance between the North Pole and Equator. Why one ten millionth? Because it was arbitrary and gave us a unit that was useful. The same can be said here. Why'd I choose this? Why'd I choose that? Because it was arbitrary, but ultimately gave us a unit that made things easier to explain and understand. So here we go. To start, we know that the unit of landmass is going to be bigger, and therefore we know all continents will fit inside this. The first part of our definition can therefore be a landmass. With just this, literally all land becomes its own continent. Every island, atoll, and sandbank. So clearly we're not done. To get rid of all these extra islands, we need to narrow down our definition. Now, if we know a continent is, by definition, automatically smaller than a landmass, we also know that it is going to be automatically bigger than any one region. So, if we look at Greenland, for example, we can see that it is entirely contained within the region of glaciers. Therefore, we can't give Greenland the title of continent because then a region, a smaller unit, would be the same size as a continent, what's supposed to be a bigger unit. Just like how one kilometer can never equal one meter, one continent can never equal one region. Greenland is important in this because it is what I believe to be the largest landmass that can be classified as just a single region. So we'll call this an island, not a continent. Again, this is a little arbitrary because if you moved Greenland somewhere else, it might develop a greater diversity of regions, but we're building this model based on the Earth what we have right now because that's the one we need to measure and explain and talk about. The next biggest landmass after Greenland is Australia, which does have several distinct regions. A desert, grasslands, temperate forests, and even a tropical rainforest. And the same can be said for every landmass larger than Greenland. So I think it works to add to our description that a continent is a landmass bigger than Greenland. Anything smaller will therefore become an island. Doing this, we get a continent map that includes America, Afro-Eurasia, Australia, oh yeah, and Antarctica. But this still isn't a very useful unit, as in truth, it isn't too different from the unit of landmass. Again, try describing where the countries in the EU are. They're on the northwest corner of Afro-Eurasia, above the Mediterranean west of Russia, okay, still basically the same as before, which means it's still not entirely useful, I think. So, our next goal should be to break up the two biggest landmasses, as those are currently the most difficult places to describe with our current definition. To do this, we're going to need to end the first sentence and make that criteria number one. 
Our second criteria then, and I'll explain afterwards, is if a bisecting line can be drawn through anywhere on a continent that passes through only a single region, it is coming to an end. Let's see what that means. Using Australia as an example, if I draw a straight line across it, it encounters multiple different regions. But if I draw a line through, let's say, here, it only passes through one region, which means the continent is about to end. Which is true as the Cape York Peninsula is forming and the continent does in fact end. This basically means that all peninsulas still count as part of continents. But then, if we add this rule, the continent ends where the single region becomes its thinnest, we'll start to see our results. First, back to Australia, we can see that this again is true. The one region becomes thinner and thinner until, at its thinnest point, in this case the tip, the continent does in fact end. But if we apply this to let's say America, we'll see that right in the middle of it we will reach a part that is only a single region all the way through. So we follow that region until its thinnest point, ah, right here, and boom, that's where one continent ends and another begins. So there now we have North America and South America. Then the one other place where this matters is over here on Afro-Eurasia, specifically here. Without humans, this would have been a single region, a desert, all the way through. So looking at the narrowest part that is still only one region, and ah, there you go, a continent ends and another begins. And now we have Africa and Eurasia. Okay, so now we have six continents, and a pretty good definition, and it makes a lot of sense to stop here, as a lot of people are comfortable with this. Where are the countries that belong to the EU? Eurasia east of Russia. Where's Russia? North Eurasia. Okay, so it works well enough, and I feel like for most people this is fine. And in fact, many people have already begun to use this as their standard model for continents. But units have to be useful for us to use, and my problem is that Eurasia contains 4.6 billion people and covers an area of 54.8 million square kilometers or 61% of the human population and 37% of all the land area on Earth. And since we design our units to be useful for us, what sense does it make to make one continent contain most of the world's population and over a third of all the land? If this is going to be a unit that's worth using, I think we need to break up Eurasia. I already know a lot of people are going to be against this, so how about this? We can consider this unit the meter unit for geography. But in the United States, our equivalent to the meter could be said to be the yard. Despite this, I couldn't tell you the last time I actually used a yard to measure something, and that's because it's still not all that useful for things at a human scale. Instead, we most often use the foot, the time-honored best unit. Like I said, all units are originally arbitrary, but being based off a human body part that we should all be familiar with, the foot is at the very least an inherently understandable unit. That's why the ancient Greeks used the paus, which is almost exactly one foot as well. It's why the Romans based their entire unit system off the pes, which also just means foot in Latin, and what do you know, it's also almost exactly one foot. Then the Chinese built their unit system on the chi, which has also been called the Chinese foot because it also nearly comes out to exactly one foot. Before the French Revolution, even the French used the pied de roue, which translates to royal foot, and again was almost exactly one foot. And of course, the English had the foot too, which is the one we Americans still use. The reason all these places used this unit is because, for whatever reason, everyone knows how big a foot is, and that makes measuring things with it easy for the human mind to comprehend. Okay, so if we're creating units that are going to be useful for humans, I'd rather create a unit more like the foot than one like the meter. And just like how the foot is smaller than the meter, I think our continents are going to need to be smaller than Eurasia. Trust me, when I started writing the script, I didn't expect to go on a rant in favor of the imperial system over SI, but I also never thought I'd be making YouTube videos for a living, so we're going to need to find a tangible way to divide this landmass, and one that humans can understand. And so, what's a more tangible divide than mountains? They literally divide up our landmasses already as they block people from passing through and usually act as boundaries for regions as well. To see them better, let's switch over to an elevation map. Here, I'd like to point out four mountain ranges that have historically separated large populations or impeded the expansion of people groups in the past. First, the clearest thing to see on this whole map are the Himalaya Mountains, which have clearly divided India and China and created the Tibetan Plateau. Here, a simple line can be drawn across the entire length of these mountains, and we have the beginnings of a new continental border. The next mountain range we can look at are the Zagros Mountains, which run straight through the Middle East and which divide the Arab world from the Persian or Iranian world. And again, a clean dividing line can be drawn across these mountains. Then we have the Ural Mountains, which are notably shorter than the Zagros and Himalayas, but have historically been the boundary which prevented expansion by land of the Europeans into Asia and Asians into Europe. 
I understand today this isn't the case as both sides are contained within the country of Russia, but of Russia's 145 million inhabitants, 110 million of them live west of the Urals, which means that 76% of Russia's population was kept within less than 25% of the country's land area, at least in part because of the Ural Mountains keeping them in. So I think it's fair to use the Urals to draw another line. And then lastly, we have the Caucasus Mountains, which very cleanly make a short border between the Black Sea and the Caspian. So using these mountains as our primary boundaries, we can begin to see five distinct continents take form across the landmass of Eurasia, with each one still bigger than Greenland, so yes, still qualifying as a continent. Taking a closer look, we can see the traditional Europe take form using the Euro Mountains, then the Zagros creates a land running from Turkey down to the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula, basically Arabia wearing an Anatolian hat, an Arabia? If you have any better ideas for a name, you know where to put them. Then we have the smallest continent that runs from the Zagros and ends with the Suleiman Mountains. This contains mostly Iran, Afghanistan, and half of Pakistan, as well as the countries up in the Caucasus. This corresponds nicely to the heart of the Persian Empire, but Persia is also an old term for Iranian, which they didn't like. So to find a provisional name for this place, we can look at the alternate name for the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid Empire. So I think a Latinized Achaemenia or Achaemenia would serve as a fine temporary name. Then we get essentially what's called the Indian subcontinent plus a large part of Myanmar. Despite being one of the smaller continents, this one would be one of the most populous, featuring a population of around 1.7 billion people, which is about the same as the population of Africa and South America combined. Despite the obvious name of this place being to keep it India, I think an alternative like A India should be used instead. First, this keeps the trend of continent names that both begin and end with the letter A, which isn't really important, but also connotates something slightly larger and significantly different from the country of India, which I think is important if more people are going to be falling under the designation than just Indians. That way, people from Pakistan and Bangladesh, for example, wouldn't become Indian, they'd become a Indian, which, ask them, is an important distinction. And lastly, we have what remains, which I think we can just call Asia. This includes what's now East Asia, you know, China and Korea, plus Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, all those guys, Central Asia, like Kazakhstan and really all the stands actually, as well as Eastern Russia, basically Siberia. At this point, Asia would still come out to a surface area of roughly 29 million kilometers, which would actually make Africa slightly bigger. So what do you think? Does this make sense? If we zoom out, we get a resulting continents map that looks like this, for a total number of 10 continents, which is actually a nice and clean number, instead of the 6 or 7 we have now. There are definitely some larger and some smaller ones, but on the scale of human society, I think it functions very well in describing major places in our history. I know people will have problems with these, but remember, you can also just go by the first two criteria if you like. It might just be slightly harder to explain some things. If you have any improvements or slight adjustments for these rules, let me know, I'd like to hear them. Again, thanks to my Patreons, you know all these people scrolling by on screen, you guys really help keep this channel running. If you'd like to do the same, there should be a link somewhere in the description. Other than that, I'll be back soon with another video. Thanks.